Hello? 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 This is the Vancouver Commercial with a state podcast. And welcome back to the Vancouver Commercial Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Corey Wright. And I'm your sometimes host, Matt Scalina. I feel like, Corey, uh, I'm always waiting for the Adam and super energetic. Yeah. And I feel like we're an NPR or CBC show here. <laughs> so, so, should we try that again? <laughs> and welcome back to your Vancouver Commercial Real Estate Podcast. How's that? Uh, so, sounded good. Sounded good. <laughs> <laughs> so who who do we got on the show this week, Corey? So this week we have John Juwani from Davidson and Company. He's an accountant, and we're going through sort of tax tips and sort of explaining how the commercial real estate world works, everything from purchases to how the taxes, and even a way you can actually defer your capital gains when you sell your property. A lot of people don't know that. Yeah, you know what? It, it's uh, We've had on our show uh, accountants uh, kind of fairly consistently throughout, and one thing you're always concerned about is – uh, listeners feeling like it's boring content and totally. it, it always, they hit it out of the park. Uh, it's amazing how popular the episodes are and how mu- many takeaways there are. It's basically like free advice and hours worth of free advice, uh, in the accounting world. And you know, it's like they say, Corey, it's not what you make. It's what you keep. John's very knowledgeable. He's a very, very, very high class, astute guy in what he does. So the information and advice he provides is really good. So stay tuned for that. But before uh, we get to uh, the talk with John, uh, Corey, how's the market? I, you just told me some information that <laughs> well, let's, my head exploded. Let, let, let's talk about the office market that's dead. So there was a recent project. It was a, a AAA strata office tower, which are very hard to come by. Uh, in the Coquitlam Town Center area. So it's located, if you know the area, you're sort of right behind Coquitlam Center there on Glen Street, and you're sort of sandwiched between two SkyTrain stations. And uh, within 48 hours, they had 30 offers. 48 hours, 30 offers on the Strata offices. And this is the office market that's dead, everybody. That, that's so they're basically they must have hit their targets pretty quick. Uh, I would think so. I would, I'm, I'm pretty sure they're in what, for financing Saturday morning. <laughs> so so this is a this is a Cressy project. Yeah, who's buying there? Well, I think the one thing too is you know a it's a rare thing to find strata offices to purchase, especially in that area. It doesn't really exist. I think the fact that they're building it to a AAA spec, you're probably going to get your accountants and law firms and medical related businesses and professional services are going to go in there to buy them. And, I mean, from a business standpoint, it's hard to find, you know, these things to buy. And when you can buy them for yourself and pay off your own mortgage and be the benefit beneficiary of any capital appreciation on your property, it, it makes all the sense in the world to buy it versus own it. And that's where one thing, too. Versus think, renting. For, sorry, versus renting. Yeah, yeah, sorry, buy it versus <laughs> renting. Uh, that's one thing a lot of business owners don't realize is – they sometimes they don't think they'd qualify. And we encourage business owners that if you're, even if you're just interested, reach out to us. We're happy to sort of go through the process and put you in touch with the right people to find out if that's something that you can you can do. But I think you know, 30 offers in 48 hours is just is unheard of. Right. And I think that's pent up demand that I think it goes to show when we talked before that when people are kind of creatures of habit and they're going to go back to what they know. And it's the confidence in the marketplace. Right, right. Right. And in terms of like starting price points for office space like that. Yeah, I think they I think the prices started around like 750, 750 a foot. And they had some offices in there that were probably just over six hundred, which I think on the advertisement they were sort of advertising offices starting at like oh, four hundred wow. and seventy nine thousand. So I mean it, it 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 becomes hard for an investor, you mean at those prices to probably make money with the local rents. Right. But I think the end user is kind of the target for those type of projects. And that that's really who your buyer is. And that's where you're going to get your best numbers from. And I know from, from talking to the uh, the listing agents involved, they were just overwhelmed with interest, which is great to hear. But I think it just goes to show this market is resilient. And I think people are kind of seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, although it's a couple of years away before it's completed. But the fact that these purchasers are writing very large deposit checks to get these properties now just goes to show the confidence that they have in the commercial markets and how we're kind of slowly going to start getting back to the way things were before. 
So this is interesting, just thinking about, you know, other residential pre-sales near Coquitlam Town Center yeah. and who the buyer is and the target market there. It sounds like, I guess, two questions. One, being an end user and buying pre-sale in the commercial space, uh, not that it doesn't make sense in residential, but yeah. especially if you're renting, you know, it's often makes sense to buy because you're basically waiting a couple of years, yeah. right? Yeah. Whereas uh, does pre-sale make more sense for end users with in the commercial space than it does residential? Uh, it can do. So when you're running a business, obviously, you, you know, you have your profit margins and your, your retained earnings on your balance sheet. So, you I mean, it gives you a chance to kind of save for it where you have money now to put down a deposit, but then you can continue to save up for what's needed to close on the property. And in commercial, for business owners or owner occupiers, you can get probably up to about 90% loan to value on the property. Pre-pandemic, you know, I mean, there was, you know, 100% financing available to some professional industries. I heard now sort of the the 90% is the new 100, or so 90 was the 100 was before. So you, you might have the ability to actually finance a lot more than you kind of anticipate going into it. And although it might be a little bit more expensive to own it versus lease something in that area at these prices, you're paying down your mortgage every month. And you're also the benefit of the capital appreciation on it. And if the property goes up 3 to 5% a year on average, you're the one that's getting that. On top of that, you're paying down your mortgage. So when you kind of look at the numbers that way, you mean they make a lot more sense on the investment side. On top of that, you're running your business and you're making money. Right. Right. So you're, you're making money in three folds there. So it's it's a phenomenal project. The success has been huge and it's great to hear. And I think it's just it, it's the pent-up demand in the marketplace for projects like this that haven't been there previously that are now coming to the market. In case you were worried about the uh, the world of office. Yeah, the office market that's dead is is thriving in some of these markets. And the I death think, of office was greatly <laughs> exaggerated. Well, it was the same story we heard back in 9-11, right? right. Like right. The office market's dead. The high-rise tower market's dead. No one's living in it. I think it's fair to say now that obviously at the time when a lot of this stuff was in question, I mean, we know none of us had answers. But I think looking back on it now, it's fair to say that, you mean, during most crisis and even this pandemic, there's a lot of assumptions made that as we kind of get through it and people kind of get back to the way things were, a lot of that goes by the wayside and we kind of go back to what we know. Well, I was going to say clearly at least 30 different groups over the last 48 hours are betting yeah. on working out <laughs> yeah. of the office. Yeah. Well, I think you're going to find too, and we, we said this before on a previous show, that from a, an employer standpoint, being able to maintain company culture, being able to maintain employees through retention – how that has to happen is you got people got to work together. Yeah, they got to get back in the office, and it's very hard to do that through Zoom. You can only do it for so long before the kind of the coolness wears off, and people start craving that type of thing. So I think from from an employer standpoint, they're going to want to get people back in the office. Now they might have a little bit more space than they did before, and that could backfill any companies that maybe feel they don't need the offices anymore. Um, but I think to 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 drive a company and build a business and create retention amongst your employees. They're going to have to have some component of being in the office on a regular basis. Fantastic. So what else do we have, Corey, before we uh, cut to our talk with John Giovanni? We're sponsored. Um, we're sponsored by Impact Commercial Group with over 50 years of commercial lending experience. For all your commercial lending needs, please visit impactcommercial.ca. The best out there, that's for sure. Yep. Well, let's uh, let's cut to our talk with uh, John Giovanni. Always love having accounts on the show. Yeah, it's yeah. like you can just ask them anything and uh, it's like a free If you ever think you're the consult. smartest guy in the room, <laughs> have a conversation with an accountant and you will belittle yourself and walk out with your tail between your legs. These guys are so incredibly smart. It's a great episode. Everyone will love it. Enjoy, the, guys. The creme de la creme. Okay, so we're here with John Gerani. He is the tax principal at Davidson and Company LLP. How you doing, John? I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? Excellent, excellent. Well, we're, we're so excited to have you on here because one thing questions we always get is is how does tax and GST and all that stuff apply to commercial real estate? And we thought having you on today, you can sort of give us the do's and don'ts and sort of maybe unpack a little bit of it. For our listeners here that are looking to either already have commercial real estate or looking to get into the commercial real estate game. Yeah, I'm, I'm, re I'm really excited to, to be here to shed some light on some of these things. And there's, 
there's definitely lots to go and talk about, and uh, we'll we'll try and get through as much as we can. Maybe before we we get into the the tax here, John, can you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm a tax principal, as you mentioned, at uh, the Davidson and Company. I've been working in the tax field for about ten years now. I've always been in Vancouver, and my practice focuses mostly on private tax, so you know, not not public companies, but small business owners and uh, and owner managed businesses. Certainly, having a tax practice in Vancouver, you see real estate all the time. Uh, whether it's residential, commercial, or, or or even some some vacant land, and we're we're really comfortable with that kind of work, and I'm I'm happy to kind of share my my knowledge here. Excellent, excellent. Well, maybe like I'm thinking from the perspective of being maybe a purchaser of commercial real estate. Can we maybe start by talking about what are some of the tax considerations when you're buying commercial real estate? Yeah, I think the first. Or one of the the biggest things to to go and consider on on purchasing commercial real estate is GST. You know, the there's often confusion re- related to it, or people forget about sales taxes on, until later on. But uh, you can you can definitely walk yourself into some trouble uh, by doing things the the incorrect way here. The, the biggest thing is that commercial property is subject to GST, and the the most common thing that I see people not really sure about is whether they need to register for GST or, or, or not, and do they need to actually pay the GST to the other person, or, or what, what needs to happen with that. Essentially, the biggest thing is that whoever is purchasing that, that real property, they're the ones that need to be a GST or re- registrant. There's rules in the Excise Tax Act that basically allow that purchaser to go and handle both sides of the transaction. And, and by that, I mean, normally when you have GST changing hands, there's one person that's responsible for collecting it and another person that's responsible for paying it. So the purchaser is under special rules that are specific to real property. They're able to handle sort of the collection and the, the payment at once. And the nice thing about this is that no cash needs to actually change hands. So if you have a commercial property that's selling for, you know, a million dollars and you have $50,000 of GST that's that's there for it, that $50,000 never needs to actually change hands. Um, and it's only the responsibility of the purchaser to actually go and do it. So it, it helps a lot from, from a financing point of view where you don't need to worry about, hey, where am I going to come up with? This extra five percent that's not actually asset backed by any matter. That's uh, that's definitely one of the the biggest things there. So, is GST uh, have to be charged on all commercial sales? Because when you sell a house, whether it be my principal residence or not, I don't have to collect, nor do I have to pay. If it's brand new construction, I do because the developers that's their business. If I'm selling my strata lot, my retail strata lot to Adam, do I have to charge him GST? Yeah, I mean, GST is, it, it, it's considered a taxable supply. So GST is something that you would need to charge, but with the special rules, you don't necessarily need to collect it. The The way that sometimes people get tripped up with these things is on the assumption that the purchaser is a, a GST registrant. And that's that's kind of the way out is if the purchaser is registered for GST, you're able to do these things on a, uh, on, a, on a non-cash basis. If the purchaser is not registered or they falsely made a representation that, that they are a GST registrant, then all of a sudden you, as, as, as the vendor, Corey, you would need to actually charge GST to that purchaser or there would be a, a, an assumption that, that you would have to. So that's why it's very important that in these transactions that it's it's not only built into the legal language of the contract where the purchaser is required to be a GST registrant, but having proof of that, that registration uh, is essential. So when you say there's no cash exchange of that, is there an exemption that me and Adam would enter into if we both have registered GST numbers from a buyer and a seller standpoint that potentially would put the onus on the purchaser to self-assess it in some way? Yeah, exactly. So the the purchaser, uh, you know, going back to my million dollar sale example, 
essentially the purchaser, if they're involved in some sort of commercial activity that involves them charging GST to their own customers, they would claim that $50,000 on their GST return as a credit and then also put on on a separate line that they have notionally paid or that that they've notionally collected this 50000 as well. So it ends up being a wash. Like when you put it on, on the GST return, there's no cash that actually needs to be paid to CRA. There's no credit that comes back. It just ends up being a net zero transaction. So John, you talk about you mean you mean the GST and stuff like that. Is there different ways of holding commercial real estate versus if I buy a house and it's my principal residence, it's in my name or mine, my wife's name or mine, my family's name? In commercial real estate, you I mean is there different ways that uh, that buyers and sellers can acquire property and then maybe hold it, and whether it be maybe like a hold co or something? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a variety of of different circumstances or, or a, a variety of different options, I, I should say, for how you can hold that commercial property. A lot of it comes down to specific tax planning that's for that entity, that individual, right? There's no silver bullet to go and say that this is the best way to go and do it for all circumstances, right? But there are some kind of key points that, or conventions that that a lot of people do. One thing to kind of draw a distinction for is, is distinction between legal title and beneficial interest. So legal title is just whose name is on the property and beneficial interest is, you know, who actually, who really owns it if you wanted to go and put it in a colloquial way. So the, the legal title can be assigned to, to anything. And the important point with this is related to property transfer tax. So what a lot of people will do with, with commercial property is that they'll incorporate some sort of numbered company or hold co and that that company will have the legal title to that property and the beneficial interest will reside with something else. The really clever thing with this is that when that commercial property is subsequently sold or if it's transferred to another related entity or who knows what, there's no, there's no property transfer tax that ends up being payable because the legal title is staying with that one company. So instead, the shares would end up being sold of that of that company. You know, maybe the name gets changed if it's purchased by a different party or who knows what. But you're able to avoid that property transfer tax, which, you know, for Vancouver real estate market, that could be tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars just to go and move things from one corporation to another in the same group. So that could be a huge way to go and, and save taxes. And it, it definitely should be the standard for, for any transaction. The other part is for who owns the beneficial interest. And as I said, that, that's flexible. It, it, it depends on what the nature of everybody's circumstances are. You know, as far as holding it as an individual, I rarely see this for, for legal purposes, you know, where I'm not a lawyer, so I don't, I don't go and claim to know this stuff in, in great detail. But, you know, if, if somebody falls and breaks their leg on, on the commercial property, and if you own it as an individual, I'm pretty sure that they can go after you, right, uh, for your personal assets. So one of the things that, that some people can do is to set up a corporation or a limited partnership in order to mitigate some of these, these legal risks. So with... A, with a corporation, I mean, that's definitely one of the simplest ways to, to go about it. Obviously, you're getting that legal protection, and then you'll have certain corporate tax rates apply depending on what your, your business is. So if you're operating an, an operating business, you'll get very favorable rates. If you're just renting it out to third parties, you know, the, the, the rates there might, might vary. And then the other thing with the with the other option, the limited partnership, I've seen this more commonly for circumstances where there's like a builder and they're trying to get this commercial property financed through more private means rather than through financial institutions. And it's a good way for the builder and then operator of that of that commercial property to keep control over what's happening even if they're not necessarily majority financer of, of the project. 
So it's great if you have the violent investor types who want to go in and buy in, and it's flexible for a variety of, of types of investors without necessarily needing to go and cater to, to each of their specific tax circumstances. So John, you talked about various ways of holding you know, real, real property. Now, if I'm going to buy commercial real estate, and let's say it's in a hold co, or maybe it's in a, a registered bear trust, can I buy the shares of that company or, or do I have to buy the asset? Is there a way I can buy the shares and is there a benefit if I buy the shares of the company that holds it? That's correct. If you have just a change in control, there is no property transfer tax because it's it's more of a land title office issue where if you have to actually go and change the the owner to a to a different party with, with that land title office, that's when you're going to end up with the property transfer tax, right? And that'll be specific to that legal title that I had mentioned previously. So if I buy a building for $10 million and I acquire the shares of the company versus the asset, then there would be no property transfer tax due on the $10 million purchase because I'm purchasing the shares, not the asset. And you're not triggering anything at land titles, I guess. Correct. The name on the title remains the same. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I want to just draw a, a distinction there, right? So if you're buying the shares of the company that holds the legal title, you're, you're not paying $10 million for that company, right? Correct. Um, you're probably paying a dollar or a hundred dollars or something nominal for it. The $10 million will go to the company that has the, the beneficial ownership in that property and people buying the, the beneficial ownership buying the the shares or or what have you that won't trigger any sort of property transfer tax no the the point you're bringing up though does bring up one important uh, tax consideration though which is increasing the cost basis of the underlying property so if you're if you're buying those shares for for 10 million dollars you're, you're not getting the tax depreciation like shares are not a depreciable asset there, there are, you know, some complicated tax machinations that you're able to go and do where you're essentially able to go and transfer some of that $10 million that you paid for the shares uh, into being cost basis for the underlying real property. And by doing so, you're, you're able to facilitate, you know, future sales and possibly depreciation on that, on that property. Okay. That makes sense. So as long as... Justin Trudeau and John Horgan aren't listening to this, then we should be okay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I, I mean, you're 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 always best off, and and it's always the the simplest thing for a purchaser to go and buy the assets of that company instead of buying the the shares. So, you know, in general, if if you're a purchaser and you're able to just buy the the property directly without having the the shares, that's going to be the simplest approach for you. And that also has the added benefits of not having to deal with any skeletons that are hiding in that in that company's closet, right? You know, if they have outstanding lawsuits that they haven't disclosed or who knows what, uh, you don't need to be attached to any of that. So John, I, I get this question all the time because obviously we have the foreign buyer tax when it comes to residential property. Is there, is there, are there circumstances where the foreign buyer tax is applicable in commercial real estate? I, I, I don't believe so. I, I don't think that foreign buyer's tax applies to any sort of commercial property. Generally, those foreign buyer's tax and the speculation tax and all, all the sorts of you know, nickel and diming taxes that they have, they, they generally apply to, to residential property. Right. So if you end up with, you know, if, if you're a, a non-resident of Canada and you're looking to go and get into the Vancouver real estate market, you know, the commercial avenue is certainly a cheaper way to, to, to go about it from the sense of not having to go and do, donate a bunch of your money to various provincial coffers. The, <laughs> I, like, the, I like how you frame it around donating. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's definitely an option. So, you know, if, if you're a big fan of John Horgan, then, you know, maybe you do want to go and buy a bunch of residential real estate as a non-resident. But you know, there's there's definitely a bunch of other things to go and consider as a, a non-resident uh, buying a, any sort of property. Um, the bigger thing is once you eventually decide to d dispose of that property, uh, there are some pretty significant withholding taxes that, that end up happening. 
and there's certain forms that you need to file to go and make sure that you know 25 or 50 percent of the gross proceeds of uh, that that commercial real estate aren't held back from you. It's mostly cash flow facilitation. Uh, ultimately, when you file whatever Canadian tax return that you have, you you settle up with with, with these amounts regardless of what's withheld. Um, but there's ways of sort of easing the cash flow that that comes with that uh, if you file the the right forms. And you, you mentioned earlier about the speculation tax or the spec tax. So if I'm buying something, let's say in Kelowna or Victoria, and I'm buying a residential condo as an investment, I would be subject to a speculation tax in those particular markets. But in commercial, if I were to buy a retail unit in the same markets, I'm exempt from any speculation tax? That's, that's right. Yeah, there's, there's, no, there's no surtax or, or special tax or foreign tax or, or anything like that that's, that's related to commercial property in, in the same way that it is for residential. Um, it's, it's, it's not the, the target of, uh, of those, those various proposals. I'm just thinking about how to buy an industrial space and, and convert it to a bedroom as a secondary residence. That's, that's, a, that's a hack. Well, if you, if, if, you give, if you give me a couple thousand bucks, I won't tell anyone at the city you buy it and that, what you're doing with it. Yeah, exactly. We just won't, won't mention whether it's up to code or not. Right. <laughs> right, right, right. Can we talk a little bit about replacement property rules, John? Yeah. So what a replacement property is, is essentially if you sell a property or, you know, if your property burns down in, in a, in a great fire, you're going to be entitled to some proceeds, uh, whether it's from insurance or from the actual sale. So, you know, let's say that you have your commercial property that you bought for $10 million. And since you bought it, it's appreciated to 15 million. And, you know, let's say that, that you sell it for 15 million, but Realistically, you know, you're operating a business, you're going to need to go and transfer that business to some other location and you need a bigger property because your business has expanded so much. So, you know, you've sold this property for 15 million, but you're going to move into a $25 million property. What the replacement property rules do for you is essentially that that lift in value from 10 to 15 million you're able to defer by the purchase of that new property. So essentially what it would look like is the gains, uh, you know, without getting too into the weeds here, whatever the gain that you would otherwise realize on that property, which includes the tax depreciation that you might've taken as well, you're able to sort of roll that into the new property and have a lower cost base on that new property, but you won't have any taxes owing when you actually sell or receive the insurance proceeds from that that other property. The the big thing for this is just that as long as you maintain ownership of a real property that was purchased within a certain time frame, then you're able to kick that tax can down the proverbial road. The one difference between these things for is, is whether it's a voluntary or involuntary disposition. So voluntary is when you sell it and involuntary is when it burns it down in in a fire. If it's voluntary, you have one tax year from the year that you sell it in order to actually buy the new property. If it burns down in a fire, they give you a little bit of extra wiggle room and you have two tax years from the time when it burns down in fire. So, you know, if there's a time of year to go in and have it, it's going to be at the very beginning of your fiscal year to, to go and have that big fire go and burn down the commercial property so that you can have lots of time to go in and find a, a, a replacement for tax to deferred savings. And as a disclaimer, we're not recommending for anyone to burn down their property from a tax benefit <laughs> standpoint. <laughs> So John, if I, if I understand that correctly, I have a, an office building I sell. I have one year to reposition those funds into another property. Then by doing so, if I can acquire something, say within an eight month period under that 12 month window I have, am I deferring capital gains taxes and that stuff down the road till I sell the second building? Correct. Yeah. It's not ultimately a tax savings. If you look at it from a holistic perspective on selling that newly acquired property, but it will defer taxes. The one thing I I should say though, as a caveat is if you 
buy a new property that costs less than whatever the proceeds were from selling or the insurance proceeds from the, the building burning down, you do have some tax recognition that needs to take place. So going back to my earlier example, if you had the $10 million property that you sold for 15, if you purchased a new property for 13 million or for 14 million, you would have some tax that would need to be recognized because you have not reinvested all of those funds into buying a new property. And the CRA wants to take its piece for the part that you have flexibility for what you're choosing to do with that money. So ideally, I'm just deferring that. And hopefully the second building will be worth more one day than the first one. So the, the capital gains at some point in time is just going to be that much bigger that I owe. Yeah, it, it, exactly. So John, if I buy commercial real estate, and obviously, I mean, it's a, I get a brand new mortgage on there and what feels like 99.9% .9 of my payment is going to interest in the first five years. Is there any benefit or is there any way I can, I can capture that interest? from a tax perspective? Yeah, I mean, essentially, interest deductibility is actually a surprisingly complex tax topic. But the easiest way to think about it for the casual non-accountant is where are the funds coming from and where are they going? So if the funds are coming from the bank and they're being used to acquire a property that you're using to, to earn income, you're able to go and take a deduction on those funds. A lot of the time when people end up getting tripped up or uh, when you end up with, with issues here is if you are borrowing funds in order to fund a non-income earning purpose. So let's say, you know, assuming that you buy the commercial property and it is you know, financed primarily by the bank and that's the only transaction, you don't need to worry about any of this, right? It's when you are refinancing and, you know, you had a global pandemic and all of a sudden you need to draw on some of that, that increase in, in value uh, on that commercial property. You know, how are you ultimately deploying those funds that you have now gained access to? So if you have a mortgage of $8 million, uh, you've renegotiated this mortgage to be $10 million on, on the property. For that $2 million, what are you doing with it? Are you spending that? on expenses of the business. If you are, then, then you're fine. If you are taking that $2 million and you're pulling it out of your company because you need to fund your personal lifestyle or you know whatever other personal obligations that, that you might have, then technically that extra $2 million that you've drawn from the bank, you're not able to go and get a deduction in that corporation or whatever entity uh, happens to have the, the mortgage. So it's very important that the way that you're you're structuring some of these things, that you're you're paying attention to that to that flow of funds. You know, there might be other options where you know if you do need two million dollars, let's say that that same company has three or four million dollars in marketable securities. You might be able to arrange it where you liquidate some of those securities, you draw that money out for the personal purposes. And then you take the mortgage on the property and instead of pulling that out personally, you're putting it back into securities that you otherwise had and using that to go and earn income. And even though it's a minor point in terms of, you know, where that cash is ultimately coming from, that's what drives the deductibility of, of that interest. It's very easy from, you know, from, from my experience with owner managers is that their corporation or whatever entities that they have under them, they consider it like their own personal bank account. And it's more taking money out as possible and doing whatever you need with it immediately rather than thinking about, you know, am I going to be offside on, on claiming interest? Super interesting. So John, in thinking about COVID, has it had any kind of impact on, on how you're doing things or are there new issues in, in tax that have come about since the pandemic? Um, well, I mean, some of the, the things that, that are coming up more frequently right now, obviously, there's the various government subsidies that are available. And, you know, to the extent that people are able to go and claim them, you certainly should. So, you know, specific to commercial real estate, you're, you're having the Canada Emergency Rent Subsidy, which I believe is effective from late September 2020. 
and that you're able to get, you know, 75,000 or, or up to 300,000, depending on what the specific circumstances are, as long as you're able to show that there was a decrease in, in revenue that, that related to those, to those properties. And then, you know, there's the Canada emergency wage subsidy if you have employees that are involved in these sorts of things. And, you know, there's a, there's a myriad of ways that the, that the federal government has, has helped out in, in these sort of circumstances. Some of the things that are more specific to landlords right now is things like, like free rent and tenant inducements. So if you're offering free rent, it's essentially a nothing for, for tax purposes, right? You're not actually getting any cash income. You don't actually pay income tax on this free rent that you've given. As a tenant, you haven't actually paid anything for rent. You don't get a d- deduction for that free rent that was allowed by the, by the landlord. You know, if you're if you as the landlord are offering inducements to your to your tenant to to go and and stay as a tenant and keep their lease or what have you, oftentimes these can be treated on a current basis. So you're able to go and take those inducements as an expense immediately, even if that inducement is calculated by something over the entire lease term. The other thing to to think about is taxation of reimbursements and these subsidies. So a lot of the subsidies and grants that the Fed has come out with, they're ultimately taxable, right? So if it's offsetting rent or if it's offsetting salaries or things like that, you have to remember that you're not getting the, the deduction anymore, essentially, for whatever that underlying thing is. Or if you do think about it, that you are getting the deduction like that, you have to think about that grant or subsidy as being taxable separately, like if it was income. So those are definitely some of the key considerations and making sure that you're you're setting money aside for what some of those those tax consequences are. So John, lastly here, I'm gonna I'm gonna put you on the spot. Is there <laughs> one tax tip that you could you could put out there that if I buy commercial real estate, this is one of the benefits and this is why I should buy commercial real estate. Here's a I don't want to say insider information, but here's here's one reason why you want to buy it. Here's a good tax tip for you. I would say that one of the better things about owning commercial real property is, you know, taking advantage of capital gains tax rates, right? And being able to get more favorable tax depreciation in a number of circumstances. You know, if you own residential real property and, and you're doing that as an investment choice and renting it out versus directly comparing that to the commercial property, there are some circumstances where with the commercial property, you're able to have a faster tax to depreciation compared to that, that residential property. And where with residential property, there can be questions from CRA as far as, you know, are you flipping the, the house and is that considered on account of income versus on account of capital? It's very rare for commercial property to have that sort of inquiry. And the difference is essentially if, if something's on account of income, you're taxed on 100% of that, that gain. Whereas if it's on account of capital, it's, it's 50%. So you have a bit more security in knowing that your purchase of that commercial property the lift in value, you'll, you'll have that capital gains rate uh, with perhaps fewer questions than, than what you would if it was some other type of property. Well, you sold me. That's <laughs> some of the most riveting tax advice I've, uh, I've sat through recently. So that's good stuff. Adam's been sitting here lift, listing all his condos for sale to move the money <laughs> into industrial now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> John, we have the MLG six pack, which we're going to ask you six lighthearted questions about yourself. Do you have a few minutes to stick around with us? Sure. Okay. So the MLG six pack is brought to you by McKinnis Law Group. So for all your commercial legal needs, whether it be commercial leasing or commercial closings, call McKinnis Law Group and you can find more about them at mlglaw.ca. All right, John, you ready? I'm, I'm, I'm right. ready. Adam, lead us off. What is your favorite movie or TV series? Ooh. Um, Just so you know, if you say Yellowstone, the interview is over <laughs> right now. <laughs> My favorite movie, you know, the, the thing that's jumping to mind right now is The Last Samurai with Tom Cruise. I don't know what it is. It's something about that that just sits really well with, with me. Nice. Good one. Good one. Favorite vacation spot 
assuming the borders reopen here in the near future? <laughs> um, well, kind of, I, I guess, related to that, that first question, Japan, I went there for three weeks a few years ago, and it was just everything that I wanted it to be and more. And, you know, we have fantastic sushi and, and Japanese food here in, in Vancouver, like really world class, but it somehow felt even more special or tasty over there. <laughs> Where in Japan did you stay? I went a little bit everywhere. I, I flew into Tokyo and then I essentially traveled west. So I spent some time in Osaka and in, in Kyoto. And then I went as far as, as Fukuoka, which is like on the one of the, the far sides of the country. And, you know, I was zipping back and forth on the uh, the bullet train. And right. so that was a pretty great experience. I mean, hour 14 on the bullet train was maybe less exciting than hour <laughs> one, but it, it was it was pretty good. Yeah. So, so how does that compare to taking the Sky Train to King George? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to plead the fifth there for local support. <laughs> All right, John. This is this is the big one that leaves everyone lingering every episode. <laughs> Favorite band, musician, or song? Oh, that's that's easy for me. Band is Muse. Oh. I've uh, I've probably been listening to them for I don't even know grade school. Oh. I very very consistently liked everything that they come out with maybe more more locally matthew good i really like oh, a lot yeah. of the stuff that, 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 that he's come up with in the last little while nice a quote or words to live by oh god i i guess if i had if i had something like that the 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 closest thing would be if if you don't ask for it you'll never get it and i profess this to my juniors or, or people who are starting to, to get into the CPA profession quite quite a bit. And, you know, sometimes even as, as business advice is, you know, nobody's going to go and hand anything out to you. And if you're not brave enough to go and ask for it, then it's unlikely that you're ever going to get it. So true. That's a, that's a squeaky wheel quote almost. <laughs> it, it reminds me of the Gretzky, you miss all the shots you don't take or whatever. Yeah, I'm can't paraphrasing. Win, can't win the lotto if you don't buy a ticket. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A book that you'd recommend listeners read? Ooh, you know, when I was in grade 12, I was recommended a book by my English lit teacher. And he actually gave me his, his copy, a shout out to Mr. Burke. He gave me a book called Gates of Fire. Uh, which is sort of a fantasy retelling of the Battle of the Gates of Thermopylae uh, with you know, Sparta and Xerxes and all that sort of stuff. Um, riveting book. I really, really enjoyed it and would heartily recommend it to anyone who is above legal age. <laughs> well, that, that, that puts my paint by numbers book I was reading to shame. <laughs> Lastly, John, a piece of advice you would give our listeners, maybe for first time people or people looking to enter the uh, commercial real estate ownership side of the business. I mean, you know, this, this might sound a bit of a self-serving thing, but really get appropriate advice. Don't think that you know everything and go gung-ho and into, into these sorts of, of matters. There's a lot of complication that exists out there and, you know, having the right advisor to, to go in and guide you through these things and, not trying to to go in and you know being penny wise and pound foolish, I suppose is the is the best way to to explain it. And uh, you know making sure that that you're getting the, the right advice from all professionals involved. You know the the lawyers, the accountants, the commercial real estate people who are involved too. I think we almost got to change that last question up now because every single professional that comes on the show gives the same advice is surround yourself <laughs> with the right people. And there's a common thread it's for a reason. It's kind of the most important thing though, right? It's like, the, it most, the, it's most, the important most important thing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> and if this episode is proof of that, just how complicated the tax outlook can be. I mean, who wants to try and figure that out on their own, right? So very good. John, how can people find out more about you and what you guys are up to at Davidson and Company LLP? You can just go onto our website, davidson-co.com, and you know you can find all of our contact information. And you know we have a wide variety of people and contacts there to, to go and help you guys out. Sounds great. Every every year I have to do my taxes. I go into uh, Davidson and Company, and I'm always lectured about overspending. <laughs> and it, and it, <laughs> so they, they they keep me on my toes. Yeah. 
Well, John, we, we keep we, you honest we, somehow, Corey. Yeah, we can't thank you enough for taking your time. We know you're extremely busy and taking your time to come on today. We really appreciate it. And uh, I'm sure all these listeners will be reaching out to you very, very soon to get some more advice on, uh, on how they can acquire and potentially uh, properly protect themselves through tax planning. Perfect. Great. Thanks so much, John. Take care. Thank you. And there you have it, folks. Our interview with John Juwani from Davidson and Company. Um, I felt stupid in the interview. I feel more stupid now. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> you sell yourself short. <laughs> Fine. I feel really stupid then. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was a great conversation that you and Adam had with with John Juwani. Man, uh, learned a lot there, that's for sure. Um, I, I, learned, I, I can't believe Muse. Uh, uh, you know, th- that one question that we ask everyone is the one topic we always talk about after. And, and I think it gives us a real good insight on, on people sort of outside of the workplace. Yeah. Like, like I know, I, I don't think I've ever posed a question to you, but if I had to say, who's your favorite band? I, you know, I would probably say the band. The band. The band, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard of the band. <laughs> okay. And I've hardly heard of Muse. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> But what else do we have, Corey, before we uh, we cut for the day? We got VIP access for the West Shore Business Park, an upcoming project there in Langford. And they can sign up for that through the website at VancouverRealEstatePodcast.com. They can, we'll send them all the information. Uh, they're set to go on sale to the public within probably a couple of weeks. I know I've said that You're before. You're getting tons of traction on this. So it's I know incredible. there's a lot of interest Incre- in Incredible. And in that area there too, it's a sub 1% vacancy rate in the greater Victoria area. And I know we're going to have Connor Braid, who's our managing broker of our William Wright commercial Victoria office. He's going to come on in the coming weeks. He's going to tell us all about that marketplace and the demand that asset class has. It's just, it's unbelievable. Right, right. No, that it's phenomenal. And again, that's VancouverRealEstatePodcast.com. The live wire is where we have the VIP yep. access. There's no reason you shouldn't be on the live wire. That's the the marriage of the Vancouver Real Estate Podcast and the Vancouver Commercial Real Estate Podcast. Does, doesn't it's, get any better. It's, it's a beautiful thing. It's I like to call it the thing. Corona and the Lime. <laughs> so so <laughs> VancouverRealEstatePodcast.com and Corey, how can people find out more about what you're doing over at William Wright? People can, can go to our website at WilliamWright.ca to find out the latest what's going on. You can sign up for our newsletters there, get all the pre-sale information, get all the new listings and all the st- uh, stats and data we put out, they can email me at corey at williamwright.ca or they're always welcome to call our Vancouver office at 604-428-5255. Anything commercially real estate related, we'd love to talk to you. and We'll put you in touch with a broker in uh, one of our offices around the province to best service your asset. Fantastic. Well, have a, a great week, guys, and I guess we'll be back next week. <laughs> Sounds good, guys. Enjoy. <laughs> Subscribe today. Subscribe today.